life is rough. A little rougher when the walkers are after you. Join us as we watch through The Walking Dead once more. And bring you all the heartache. Easter eggs, hidden details. And survival tips that we can find. Related Geek now brings you... Sunday of the Dead. Warning, Sunday of the Dead contains spoilers for The Walking Dead franchise. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hello. And here we are. Season 2, Episode 11, Judge, Jury, and Executioner. Mm -hmm. I'm Marshall. I'm Lainey. I'm Corey. And this is Sunday of the Dead. So we're we're going over this episode, and this was a big one. This was. I think these last three episodes are really ramping it up into the end. Um, Mm -hmm. There's a... A lot of action that happens in these episodes, so it's going to get a little crazy. This is definitely where I, I like. I was expecting, oh yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna watch one episode. No, I watched till the end of the season. I was just barreling through them. <laughs> so this episode is directed by Greg Nicotero and written by Angela Kang. It was originally broadcast on March fourth, twenty twelve, in the U.S. on AMC. And upon airing, the episode garnered 6.771 million viewers. It became the highest rated cable telecast of the day, attaining significantly higher ratings than that of Storage Wars on A&E and Real Housewives of Atlanta on Bravo. Similarly, the episode outperformed all cable television programs during the week dated March 4th. Now, Angela Kang, is she the showrunner now? Is that who I'm thinking of? That is correct. Angela Kang is currently the showrunner on AMC's Walking Dead. She joined the staff in season two as a story editor, and then she went to co-executive producer in season five. That's really awesome that they do promote from within, not just pulling in new talent. Uh, that's I respect that a lot. You kind of need to make sure that you have people that know the material inside. Mm-hmm. And being that she was a writer all the way back here when things really started to go deeper character, that's probably why they were like, yeah, you, you can take over. You know what you're doing. Yeah, yeah, that's logic, but it's, we're talking about Hollywood, so that's why I'm glad to see <laughs> when they actually do that. So let's open up this episode. We are at the farm, and Daryl is basically beating the crap out of Randall to interrogate him. Mm-hmm. Uh... Randall says he met the group he that he is with on the road and that there are about 30 guys, but he doesn't mention Jane. We don't know about Jane. No, he doesn't mention Jane. I, I don't think we're ever going to find out about this mysterious Jane. I want to. If another Jane shows up, I'm going to be like, Jane! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One thing I do want to bring up, though, here is that he's... Daryl's trying to get out of him. Where are these guys? Where, where are they camped? And he can't get that out of him. At first he says, I don't know. Then he says, we met on the road. And, and like slowly over time, he's revealing more information and changing his story. Right. So we can already kind of feel like we can't really trust this guy. Mm-hmm. I just want to say, because I don't think I was involved in the previous podcast talking about this character. The actor, I do really like a lot. I watch him in The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. He plays Mr. Maisel. I thought he's good. And I think what Marshall's saying about how he's playing the character, where he's just kind of slowly dripping out and kind of kind of playing a yo-yo act with this crew. I wanted to bring up the buildings on the farm because at first I was like, oh, he's in the barn. But he's not in the barn. He's in this shack. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it looks like there's a shack. There is a chicken coop building, and then there's the barn building. So in this shack, it looks like there's a rocking chair. There's a a regular chair. There looks like to be some kind of like desk table thing in the middle of it. But that is really it. That's all that's in the shack. I feel like this is like a big tool shed almost. Mm -hmm. And that they emptied it out of all the tools to put him in there. Right. And I know that this is also the shack that has yet another porch swing in the front of it as well because there's 30 million of them on this farm apparently and as daryl comes up on randall he has this really nice hunting knife with a leather holder on his side yep and then here comes the part of the scene that i just stopped watching me too um where (laughs) you guys might have to help fill in um but daryl presses his knife into randall's leg wound 
that's where I kind of like started to check out a little yeah, bit. Yeah, it didn't break skin with it. He just pushed it up on a, where he knew there was pain. He yeah. pushed the flat end of it. He didn't like really cut him. He's yeah, like, I didn't. I didn't feel like he was trying to cut him. He was just trying to scare the crap out of him. And then Randall says that the group has heavy automatic weapons, which makes me think that maybe these guys either are the remnants from Fort Benning or they raided Fort Benning's because they did talk about how it was overrun with quote unquote lame brains. Mm-hmm. So I think that's where they got all these automatic weapons. Right. From. I honestly like. I think your instincts are good, Marshall. With this, I don't think we could trust anything he said. Correct. He might say that to keep them away from the group and just give himself enough time to try to uh, figure out a way to escape. He can tell enough about their group that they try to stay on the safe side as much as possible, and because they've got kids to protect and stuff. So then maybe he just said that to say stay away from us. Very likely. Right. Very likely. And then he tells a story, and you're talking about how you can't trust a lot, but this, I trust, this story, because it's just so gross. Um, He says that they took him in to this group. There's a whole group, men, women, and children. And then at one point, some of them found this small campsite with a man and his two daughters. And what he alludes to, although he doesn't very specific about it, is that they abused the girls while the father watched, and that Randall didn't do anything. He just he just was there. He didn't stop it either, obviously. Yeah. But And this actually brings me back to episode one of this season in What Lies Ahead. They find this tent. In there, there's this man, well, the remnants of a man, who's wearing a pin that says no excuse for domestic violence, and he shot himself. And we were left to think that he shot himself out of despair because of the apocalypse but what if this was actually that guy what if this was the father of that of the two daughters and that's why he did this to himself and he he even goes on to say that they then took the girls with them which means that they're planning to do more to right them. just for that alone i don't feel bad about the fact that they were shooting these guys in the bar mm-hmm. and outside. I, I'm sorry to say this. Maybe this sounds really bad, but they deserve to die for what they yes. did to those girls. Obviously, we don't know who it was. But Randall says something that says they didn't even kill them after. What? It, it's supposed to make sense to kill people after doing something immoral to them. That they can do something to these people and then just kill them because they're disposable. And I think... While this is part of what this group is wrestling with, do we kill him, do we not kill him, for these things alone, I feel like their mentality is just disgusting. It's just so disgusting. And it looks like I'm not the only person who thinks so. Daryl really does not like this story. Well, because of Sophia, he's very protective of the, the girls. I agree with you. This had to be true because there's no advantage to him telling this story. And I would say that they didn't even kill him them after. He's kind of like, I didn't get killed because I didn't want to see that anymore. I was kind of like disgusted with the people I'm with. You know what I mean? There's a little yeah, bit of that in there. It's there like, is, but he just let it happen. You know, like, I know he's just a kid, quote unquote. I know that he doesn't feel like he can stand up to these guys, but... He wants to go back to these guys, even after knowing what they did, seeing what they did. He wants to go back. So he still, he's culpable. I, again, I'm really happy that Mm Daryl responds the way he responds when hearing this story. I think because he's so upset about it and because he's just wants there to be repercussions. Yes. He's so, he's so upset. And I like that they gave Daryl this situation where he can prove that he's still a good guy and that something like this is something he would never ever think of doing all right let's go to the rv camp where the group is around the campfire discussing what they need to do with randall this happens i feel like the entire episode is just them going in circles about what to do with randall (laughs) you know i'm not exactly happy about this fact that they just have to keep talking about it and talking about it but 
that is what this episode is about. Th- this episode is pretty much the 12 angry jurors of Walking Dead. Yeah, it kind of is. Yeah, it is. <laughs> so Daryl comes in and he's got bloody hands and he kind of tells them that this is what I found out. This is what he did. And Carol actually takes note of it and she's like, hey, um, you your knuckles are bleeding there. And he's like, yeah, we had a little chat. Yeah, but if Carol had known what they were actually really talking about, I don't think that she would care. I'm with you on that. She'd <laughs> be like, true. okay, go ahead and hit him again if you want. Exactly. <laughs> so Rick says they have to eliminate the threat, and Dale does not like this idea because Dale is legitimately the moral center. As we will see throughout this episode, he is the one who is trying to change everyone's minds about what happens. He also says there should be a process and a discussion. Now, I do agree with him in this case. I feel like there needs to be some kind of system that is set up where it's not a dictatorship, that it is kind of a democracy, but at the same time, there should be checks and balances. They need to start figuring out as a community how their quote-unquote governing system is happening in in this situation. Exactly. So Rick says that they will convene at sunset, and what happens, happens. And I also want to bring up, like, two of the main leaders of the camp are law enforcement officers. They're sheriffs. So when you go into Georgia law, I took a look, and I'm I am not a legal professional, so don't quote me as definitely right, but I did some lookups of what the actual things you would charge Randall with if you were to send, take him to court. Because... If you're an accessory in Georgia, you are charged as if you committed the crime. He is an accessory to three crimes, two counts of each. One is cruelty to children, one is trafficking of persons for sexual servitude, and one is rape. And when you add it all together, even if you were to take the cruelty to children and trafficking and have him serve them at the same time as the rape charges he would have a minimum of 50 years in prison. If you charged him for all of these at maximum, he would have gotten the chair. So he is somewhere between life in prison and death, according to law. And because of Andrea's past job, would have known that. She would have. But we'll talk about that in the next scene, where we go into the RV and Andrea is looking for guns yet again. And then Dale comes in and she's like, hey, where are the guns? And he just reaches under the table. And that table was clearly visible from when you walk into the door. So how did she not see this right. bag that says police right across I it? I mean, you kind of come up into the RV from below the stairs looking right at the table. So how is it not at yeah. your eye level? I don't know. So Dale wants Andrea to guard and protect Randall so he can talk to people. So at this point, it is revealed that Andrea was a civil rights lawyer. This is really surprising to me. I did not remember this at all. Mm -hmm. But she hasn't really acted like she was a civil rights lawyer. Not really. I get having grief about your sister. She's kind of in her own head in her own world. She doesn't really act outward towards people that much. And if that's your job, you would think that there would be more sympathy with her. Right. Exactly. She would advocate a little more, or she would say, well, you know, in the state of Georgia. But at this point, she probably doesn't know the whole thing that you looked up with. He was an accessory. But still, she's kind of just taken the fence, right, at Mm -hmm. this point. There's this whole discussion of what is civilized versus what is uncivilized that Dale is making, and I think a lot of his points are very good. But Andrea doesn't agree but she's like, I'll watch him. I don't have time. I'll, I'll watch him. I get to hold the gun. It's yeah. good. Yeah. And this is also kind of nice that she's she's starting to kind of listen to Dale, even if she doesn't agree with him. Right. Where before she would have just offhandedly been like, no. Yeah, no matter what. Yeah. Yeah. Back at the shack, Randall is trying to escape. This is also a part where I tiny, tiny bit checked out because his wrists are so bloody. And every time he tries to escape, he's like, putting the handcuffs deeper into his wrist, and it just, I can't. Yeah. That is the kind of gore that I can't stand, is real gore. Like, things that are obviously not fantastical, they are 
possible. things that could, yeah, possible things that could happen. So this is kind of core. I'm like, no. For us, we have very empathic minds, very right. imaginative, empathic minds. So we actually almost feel the pain. Mm -hmm. in a way we imagine feeling the pain of right. what they're going through and so we can't watch that right exactly i'm good just 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 show the blood it's all good <laughs> i'm not that much but it doesn't bother me like yeah he's totally them. detached from everything in reality he, he doesn't feel that sort it's of a thing. story <laughs> so andrea is outside the shack randall is inside saying well you know are you going to kill me or all that jazz and then carl is asking shane about randall um, as they're walking up, and he's like, is he a kid? Because he hears people calling him a kid. I don't know that I would call him a kid. Really. Actually, we know exactly how old he is, because I found a deleted scene. We'll go, we'll get there. We'll get there. I just remembered that. Okay, so, anyway, talking about if he's a kid, Shane's like, no, dude, just go. <laughs> you don't need go to be away. a part of this. So Carl kind of goes around the back of the shack, and we'll find out where he goes in a minute. But then Shane and Andrea are talking, and they're kind of on the same page, right? Because they're usually on the same same page about everything. Sometimes they're on the same seat. Yeah. The car. But Shane just wants to take care of things, like, as Shane does. Randall can hear him, both of them, from their conversation from inside. Shane is doing that squatty head cock thing, even though Andrea is standing, like, next to him. Mm -hmm. He's doing the squatty head cock at her, and I'm like, oh, <laughs> again? He's trying to convince somebody, and he thinks that he's right, so he's trying to talk down to them by talking up at them. Well, I think it's a really interesting character choice for Jane Burnethal that he picked this thing that, that his character does to denote condescension or power, instead of having like a superhero stance. And Shane obviously wants to stage a coup against Rick. Against Herschel, he doesn't care that it's Herschel's farm. He just wants to stage a coup. But Andrea is not down with that at all. They're having this discussion about potentially doing a coup right in front of a prisoner. It is the wall of separation that they aren't considering. But they aren't considering the fact that he could possibly hear them because he's in a different location. Exactly. All he has to do is start saying something to the wrong person, and now the entire group is going to get torn apart. But he is. He, yeah. He's taking note of all of this. Yeah. We find out where Carl is. He's up in the hayloft watching Randall from the top. He doesn't say anything, really. And then Randall is sitting there trying to be like, hey, how are you? I've met your dad. He's so nice. <laughs> trying to endear himself to Carl. I thought it was kind of fun watching it through this time because it's like, hmm, the Grimes kids sure are curious about prisoners. Oh, yes. I didn't even make that connection, but yeah, later on, Judith is very friendly with Megan. Yes. But not totally trusting. Okay, and Carl is up there, like, analyzing him. And when you watch him, he does the same headcock move that Shane does. Almost as if he's like, oh, is that really what you No, did? actually, that's Rick's move. Yeah, have you seen Rick do that when Rick someone is talking? That. Rick does that, too. He does the head cock and then he walks forward. Mm -hmm. That's his big thing. Is he mm -hmm. like... So then Shane comes in, and because he can hear Randall talking, and he's like, he comes in, he starts to threaten Randall. He's like, Carl, what are you doing in here? Carl's like, well, I can handle myself. But, you know, he says to Shane, please don't tell my parents about this. If he can handle himself, number one, maybe he should be adult about his decisions and talk to his parents about it. Yep. But obviously he can't because like, don't, don't, don't tell my mom, okay? Carl also still doesn't totally understand mental manipulation, which is what is happening with Randall a little bit and Shane to a certain extent. Oh, yeah. I think it's something that he definitely has to grow into, and I think he does eventually, but he is just too young to understand the subtleties of what is said on conversation. I think you're right. He has a difficult time with subtle mental manipulation, but I think he was kind of aware that Randall was trying to manipulate him. Because when he goes in, Randall starts making all these promises about how you know, he can get everybody away and, and go to someplace safe. And at that moment, Carl gets like this hard look in his eyes like, wait a minute, this doesn't seem right. Well, here's the thing I was thinking while you guys were talking. We always think about, okay, there's Carl, and he's got his parents. Carl's from a broken home. 
Yeah. His his family, if the zombie apocalypse hadn't happened, they're split up. Right. They're straight up going divorce. So he's coming from that place of like rebel. You know, kids from that kind of family will rebel and say, I, I'm just going to do it because nobody's doing it for me in that way. Hmm. So I think he's pushing out in that way, but it ultimately, and it's sad, it, a zombie apocalypse raised Carl better than his parents did. Shane says to Carl, quit trying to get yourself killed. So here's a question for discussion. Do you think Shane has a point? Is Carl, in fact, trying to get himself killed? Actively trying to get himself killed? No. But he is not very wise. In later seasons, he will go and infiltrate the saviors to try and kill Negan. That's a suicide mission. He ends up dying trying to save a a stranger. I think he values certain things higher than himself. So, Wow, spoiler there. uh, We do spoilers here. (laughs) Carl's lack of self-preservation stems from his innate humanity and positivity. And a result's perspective. I don't think he's actively trying to get himself killed. He just doesn't care about whether he dies in the process. Yeah, I would say that the better path for him at this point would be to have conversations and try to gain knowledge Mm -hmm. from people that obviously, even if it's Shane, honestly, at this point, if he just would go around the campfire and say, so what should I do in this situation? What should I do in this situation? You seem to kind of know how to get through situations, how to read people, how to this. And that would be the wiser path than just go, but I'm going to do this. And that's kind of what that mode he's in because he hasn't had a strong foundation in the Grimes family. I also think he no longer has an age-appropriate friend. Yeah. She died. The next age-appropriate friend would be Beth, and she's comatose in a bed right now. So his only recourse right now is to latch himself onto Randall, who seems to be a tiny bit closer to his age, just a bit, and really try to figure him out. But if he had a playmate who was about his age, I don't think a lot of this quote-unquote mischief would really happen. That's a really good point, because that's where we learn fears. So. There is a deleted scene. I think it goes right about here. It makes sense. Carl goes to talk to Daryl. Daryl is putting like some more arrows in his crossbow. They have a whole conversation about how guns are more precise than a bow and arrow. But I think if Daryl had really been astute about the conversation... He would think that he would need to show Carl how to shoot a bow and arrow. Because Carl is actually showing interest mm-hmm. in it. Then Carl kind of leaves and Carol comes and brings Daryl a cloth for his hands. And she basically says to Daryl that since Daryl was mad at her and couldn't hit her, he chose to go take his anger out on the kid. And how does he react to that? He just kind of does this look in the, the scene... Kind of I, <laughs> I, I think the thing you were saying about the car with the accuracy of guns versus arrows, I think they probably took that out because at one point in a previous episode, Rick was like, we got to start using knives more than guns. Right, yes. So that just contradicts it. So it's kind of like, you're right, yeah. there's a missed opportunity where they could have gone further into the non-firepower. I have another weapons. question for you about this scene, though. In this scene, does Daryl take his gun out of his saddlebags? Uh, they aren't by his motorcycle. Okay. They're actually near the farmhouse a little more. I put it here, but in the next scene is where Daryl is by his motorcycle. And no, he does not in that scene. So, okay. No. Where Daryl is in the next real scene is he's at his camp, but he's kind of next to this big brick smoker that's in the middle of the farmyard, like... In the outer farm. He is reloading his arrows by the smoker oven thing. Yeah. And this is something that I found was kind of interesting because you can actually give your arrows a lacquer in such a smoker. This is something that was used in making traditional shillelaghs and that you would take butter or animal fat and you'd coat the wood and then you'd hang it inside of a smoker. So the chemicals from the smoke would go up and get embedded 
in the fats and then the fat would melt away, leaving a lacquer on there, a nice shiny smooth shell. So does this help your arrows like be more stable and sturdy? I, I believe so. It's not only going to make it so that it, it's less likely to break, but it's also just going to help its aerodynamics. What are you saying? It's like a swimmer's shaving. Guys, yeah. they shave. You streamline their swimming. Mm, okay. Yeah. So Dale approaches Daryl and talk, tries to talk about what's happening with Randall. And Daryl says he doesn't care what happens to the group or Randall, and he's a big fat liar. Dale does appeal to Daryl's decency, and we know that Daryl has a lot of decency because of some of the decisions that he has made. And then we find out that Daryl has figured out what Shane did to Otis because he showed up with Otis's gun after he said Otis was going to cover him. And I was like, here we go again with Daryl's amazing ability to pick out the details and you know, analyze a situation. Here we go. Right mm-hmm. here. He was very astute. And then as the scene is ending, he walks away and he says, this group is broken. And I'm like, so fix it. You are astute enough to see what the problems are. You know that Rick has been ignoring the issue with Shane, but you haven't been doing anything to change things. You've been sitting off to the side, you've been feeling sorry for yourself, but you're not going in and going, hey, did you notice this? I just want to bring that fact to your attention. Bye. And that would have been enough for Rick, probably. Mm -hmm. But how was Daryl developed in his household? He had to be submissive to people that were jerks. And he didn't communicate. Yeah, they didn't communicate except by yelling and probably beating. And that's why he is, so the strength he got out of his family was observation. That's mm-hmm. the, the astute mm-hmm. thing you're talking about. Yeah. He, he Because the strength of his character is, I'm not going to be in a house like this again. I'm not going to be mm-hmm. in a home like this again. So if this is all it's going to be, I'm out. So there is some strength in him, but he's not developed enough to actually stand up and be the leader. And later on, you know, there's he still fights that being a leader thing later on as well. We move to the farmyard where Laurie goes to talk to Rick in the barn. Rick is kind of staking out the barn now that it's been totally cleaned out. They're thinking about maybe they can all move in there when the winter comes so they're a little warmer. Um, Or they can talk to Herschel about staying in the house. And while they're doing this and they're talking about this, Rick is planning to use the farm, the barn as a gallows. He's actually setting up the noose and and figuring out the best way to do it. And he says to Lori that he isn't sure what the best way of execution was. So I was like, okay, I'm going to go do a little search and see which way is the most humane. And actually a bullet to the back of the head. Be the most humane way to do it in this situation because even with a hanging or a beheading, the the brain is still active for a few seconds. So you can feel the pain of what's happened to you. With a bullet to the brain... You don't feel it. The The brain doesn't have any ability to act. Mm-hmm. I also want to bring up, why are you planning on possibly going to live in a barn that you just hung somebody in? Yeah, that, that, doesn't, that doesn't feel good. Fortunately, they don't have to deal with that at all. Yeah. For multiple reasons. Lori says she supports Rick if he thinks that it's best, whatever he needs to do. And she does ask what happens on the road between Shane and Rick. Yeah, I wrote here that Lori is just abdicating responsibility. I don't know who she thinks she is. She just kind of doesn't have a center at all. She says, can we just move on to the next thing? Like, she wants it to be like it was, and if it can't be like it was, then let's get to tomorrow and just get to tomorrow, but not actually, like, be a person. In the next episode, there is a conversation that happens between her and Shane, and we'll definitely talk about that. Because of the repercussions, I believe, of what happens. When she thinks she is taking responsibility, it actually has an adverse effect because of her method. So we'll talk about that in the next episode, but I definitely agree with you what you're saying. She, she, she's not able to see unbiased and clearly about what she is doing. She's, she's trying to be like the strong female. She's trying to be like the, you know, 
El Presidente wife, and she she can't do it. But Rick says overall that Shane is no longer going to be a problem. Rick, really? And when he does so, he takes the noose and he yanks it really hard. And I, I I'm feeling like this is a very subtle way visually of saying that Shane's at the end of his rope. That one more slip up and he's done with Shane. In the yard, Carl is visiting Sophia's graves and he has what looks like bullets or bullet shells casings. Yeah, he's got the bullet casings. And actually, in the previous scenes that we've seen him, he's been digging these up out out off of the roads that's been leading between the farmhouse and the barn. He's actually been collecting all the bullet casings from Barngate. Why? And how did we miss this before? I don't know. But I I noticed that he had been doing it before, and then I see him doing it again here, and he's got multiple. So he's been collecting them. This was a big event for him, apparently. And he's getting these mementos from it. But we never see him again. I mean, yeah, we don't know why he's doing it. So Carol is trying to talk to Carl about how everything's going to be okay, Sophia's in heaven, it's going to be nice. Like, she's trying to you know, be a comfort to him. But Carl is not having it. So Carl calls Carol, say that three times fast, Mm -hmm. an idiot for believing in heaven. And I'm like, whoa, Carl, calm it down, dude. (laughs) That was kind of disrespectful. Carol is going through this worse than you are, so you need to shut it. Yeah. Right? So then Carol kind of goes over and tells off Carl to Rick and says that, uh, and Lori, I think, because they're both still there, and says that Carl is dis- disrespectful. So Lori tells Carol to calm down. Seriously, mm-hmm. Lori? So people need to understand while Carol is emotionally, she actually isn't just withdrawing, and she's actually helping people to heal. So maybe they should recognize. She says that that people either avoid her, or they like basically just diss her or whatever, and that they're just not, they don't understand that she's actually healing from this, everything that she's trying to do. And when we really think about it, she's been healing from this trauma really fast for how bad that trauma was. It's been a week since they found Randall. It's been two weeks because it was a week between when they took him to the farm and got him cleaned up to when they went to public works. Mm -hmm. And then it was a week between public works and the point we are now. And that's when she discovered that her daughter was dead. Mm-hmm. In two weeks, she's gone from being totally distraught by it to trying to help other people mm-hmm. deal with it. I think this just shows just how hard of a woman she is. Mm-hmm. And it cements why she deserves so much respect. Rick goes to talk to Carl about talking back. And Carl denies it at first. But then he's like, okay, well, let me explain what I, what I was meaning by this. And Rick says, take, don't talk. Think. It's a good rule of thumb for life. Talk less. Smile more. And this is uh, A. Burr from Hamilton. That it is. This is the first of two Hamilton references we actually have in this episode. That is funny. First, yes, it is a good rule for life. A lot. Second, ironic. Shouldn't he be thinking about, like, himself and about Randall? Of talking less? Thinking about what is happening to Randall? Carl says, Lori wants Rick to talk more. Kind of a cheeky little boy there. That Carl. And again, this also shows that all those fights that Rick and Lori had before the apocalypse happened, that was done with Carl in the room. Or that he heard it. That he could overhear it, which means that they were doing it very loudly. But yeah, she wasn't being very considerate about her son's mental health when she was starting drama with her husband. Mm -hmm. Rick says he still needs to apologize to Carol. And Carl says that killing Randall is going to fix Rick's mistake. Mm. Wow, Carl, still... Still with the mouth. And then I think at the end of the scene, Rick says, don't talk. I think, again, who could I tell you this? Shut up. <laughs> I don't think he's so shut up. But yeah. For some reason in this episode, Carl is just like, I don't know where his head is at. It's, it's like, Well, he, he was staying the car check for all the time, all this time. He was like, go to the, go to the house. Don't be a part of what's going on. He's constantly, right. his family has constantly just been protecting him not been preparing him. So therefore, when this big event happens and people die, people that were zombified, people that he knew, he's doing what he can to work his way through it. Part of it is 
Let me investigate what these bullets are like. Let me look at this. Let me look at that. But the fact that his family is not preparing him for it is causing him to just lash out in the ways that he's lashing out. Rick is the only thing that his response was the only thing that I would say was decent parenting in this whole thing. Yeah. In the other parts of the farm, Dale, Herschel, Patricia, and Jimmy are out with cows who have been running through the fence. So they've been trying to like catch them and like put them all together all morning. Herschel doesn't want to know about Randall and says he trusts Rick. He doesn't want him around the girls. He no longer thinks the same way about murder and the consequences of being accessory to murder. He doesn't think the same way. All he thinks about is protect the kids. Yeah. And he's talking about how, like, I don't want to know. Don't, Don't involve me in any of this conversation. Plausible deniability is not innocence when you say you don't want to know. That's just saying, don't blame me. Mm -hmm. Dale seems to be the lone voice in all of this. Mm -hmm. It very much surprises him that Herschel is not on his side. Yeah, so when Dale says, I don't want to live in a world like this, Dale writes his own ticket. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, that's kind of like, if you pay attention to what things are written, you'll hear these little red flags that come up, and that's definitely one of them. Mm -hmm. There is a beautiful shot of the lake and the farm that they do here. I really loved it. Um, But right around here, I think another deleted scene happens where Maggie finds her old yearbook with Randall's picture and she's talking to Glenn about it. She says that he was a sophomore when she was a senior. And then there are a few cute pictures of Maggie when she was younger. So if she's 22 and he was a sophomore when she was a senior, that means he's 20. Right? Is mm-hmm. my math right on Probably this? Probably around that range. Right, yeah. right. Because I think she said she's 22 somewhere, like, in another episode. Glenn says he was a geek in high school, and Maggie gives him this look like, uh, you kind of still are? <laughs> mm-hmm. And I think Glenn understands the look, and then says, well, Maggie wouldn't have noticed him in high school. And she's like, don't be too sure. I like geeks. It's a really cute scene, and I kind of wish they had kept it in there. But I understand why. I mean, if they had cut out some parts of Dale running around the camp, (laughs) maybe they could have put this tiny little scene in there. I don't know. But it was a nice moment. And I thought it was a really good insight as to Maggie's viewpoint of Glenn. Mm -hmm. At Daryl's camp in the forest, Carl finds Daryl's camping area. And he starts checking out his spot. He's looking at the squirrels. (laughs) Whatever. And then in the panniers of his bike... He finds a gun and he steals it. This gun is kind of a highlight over the next two episodes. <laughs> it's a conspiracy gun and we're going to go there as we talk about the next two episodes. Yep. So then he goes tromping off down to the creek. And as we remember from before, when Herschel and Jimmy took Rick down there, the walkers get caught in the silt. So I called it Silt Creek because I didn't know what it was really called. So he sees a walker that is caught in the silt. So at first he's a little scared. And then he realizes, hey, this walker can't move. I'm going to play around with them a little bit. No. So he starts to torment the walker by throwing things. And at this point, like, again, I have to say, this is so weird. He wants to be taken and viewed as an adult, but he keeps making these decisions that are immature and foolish. And I feel like that's kind of consider his role models. He has one on one side, he has this good man who foolishly rushes into danger for the sake of others. And then you have this other guy who's a selfish man who lashes out at everybody mm-hmm. to preserve what he wants. And when those are your two role models you aren't sure which one is actually right, you kind of are left with this strange alchemy that is going to go really bad really fast. Mm -hmm. Um, Also, when I'm watching him, he's got this calculating look on. When he's throwing those rocks, I think that's him trying to test and see, is this zombie actually stuck, or is he just stuck enough that he's not motivated enough to get to me? And then you see him, like, he's trying to train himself to be useful. That's why he's out here. I think he was looking for a walker so he could train himself to shoot. That's some heavy, deep analysis, and I'm not going to refute any of it, except to say he's a kid and he's in the woods. When you're a kid, especially a boy, and there's a reason why, Laney, you probably don't understand this, boys cut off lizards' tails because they know they're going to grow back again. This is him 
experimenting with nature. What now is nature? Now is nature is zombies are part of nature. This is as simply as this. The, I mean, Johnny Knoxville made a fortune off a of jackass because of it's what little boys do. And he made a show and movies out of it. It's just guys destroy stuff to figure it out. That's kind of what they do. And that's kind of where he's at. I also would like to make a point that he needs a playmate. Yes. And point number two, this is another uh, argument for a slingshot. Come on. Yeah. At the farm, Shane has guns and hollow point bullets in the back of his Honda car. I think it's actually Maggie's car. I can't remember. They have a lot of cars on this farm. Maggie's car got crashed. The one that Lori stole, that was Maggie's car. That was Maggie's car. Okay. Dale comes up to Shane, says he wants to change Shane's mind about Randall. I think this is completely useless. This whole, like, this conversation, no. Um, Shane says that if Dale convinces people to keep Randall alive, then Shane will go along with it. But Dale takes the blame if something happens. I don't believe Shane. Oh, I don't believe Shane at all. What I am noticing is that this is one of the few times where Shane is having a discussion where he believes that he's right, but he doesn't do the squat and head cough. He's actually standing completely naturally and talking to Dale on eye level. In a weird way, this is almost as if he's approaching the conversation like Dale's is equal, because Dale isn't coming after him like, I know better. It's more of, I want to have a discussion with you. Do you think this changed after Dale tried to hide the guns? Possibly. At the farmhouse, Herschel is with Beth, and he's doing a rhyme about doodlebugs. And I did a kind of a deep dive into this rhyme. Let's have something light, okay? For such a cute name, they are kind of gross looking. They look like a fuzzy cockroach with two pincers. So he digs a funnel in the sand and goes to the bottom of the funnel, and he covers his whole body with sand. Then he shakes the sand off his mouth and waits for, like, an ant to fall into the hole so he can eat it. This rhyme that they are chanting is chanted at a doodlebug's hole to try to get him to come up and show himself. Sometimes the person will also put a thin stick into the hole to try to lure the doodlebug up. There seems to be quite a few doodlebug rhyme variations, but the most common one is, Doodlebug, doodlebug, come out of your hole. Your house is on fire and your children will burn. That's fun. The doodlebug is actually the larvae of what grows into an ant lion, which is like a huge fly. It is like humongous. Herschel's poem seems to be the alternative of this rhyme, where the second line is, fly away home or go away home. You can kind of hear him saying it to Beth. And I think, and this is really funny, over the past... I don't know, week or so, I have heard so many dads call their little girls doodlebug on TV and movies that we've watched, and and I never noticed it before until I saw this episode that this is a thing, that yeah. you would call your child a larvae that likes to eat ants. I mean, it's such a cute name for such an ugly little insect. Even in uh, This Is Us, they call the girl Kate right. Bug. They just call her Bug. Right. I don't know if they caught it. I don't know if they abbreviated from Doodle Bug, but they just mm-hmm. call her Bug. And there's something I wanted to bring up here. You take a look at the lines of that rhyme, and I'm going to tell you that all of our survival group here, they are the Doodle Bug. They are currently just this larva waiting for some windfall to come their way, some hope to come their way and fall into their mouths so they can just have it. Mm-hmm. But their home is about to be on fire. Mm. And when they emerge from this, they will become much larger. When the doodle bug comes out of its cocoon, it balloons in size. It is the largest difference between larva and adult form of an insect ever seen. That's what this group is going to do. Interesting point. Glenn comes in to check on Beth, and Herschel and Glenn have a whole conversation you know, Herschel says that Beth is, you know, doing better. She's, you know, slowly getting better. But then they have a conversation about Glenn's background. And um, so Herschel asks Glenn where his family is from. And he is from Michigan and Korea. And Herschel says that immigrants built this country. Let's have our other Hamilton reference. Immigrants, we, we get, get the, the job, job done. done. And then Herschel says that his ancestors came from Ireland. Glenn says something like, yeah, with a name like Green, I figured that's what was happening. 
Virgil tells Glenn about the pocket watch, the history of the pocket watch, and that it's been in his family forever and it was handed down. Um, I looked at the time and you can very clearly see that it says 620 Yep, on that watch. Herschel tells a story about how he pawned it at one point for drinking and that his first wife, Josephine, who is Maggie's mom, bought it back from the pawn shop, kept it for a long time, and then gave it back to him later, which was awesome. But he, because he does point out that Josephine was Maggie's mom, that confirms that Beth is either her half-sister or her stepsister. Mm -hmm. We think it's stepsister. Yeah. Right? So then Herschel says... No man is good enough for your little girl until one is. This is fantastic. Herschel is saying exactly what he needs for Glenn, where he's still dealing with those feelings of freezing up after Maggie says, I love you. And Herschel was there for all of that. And I think what he said was exactly what Glenn needed to hear because of his insecurities. Then Herschel gives his watch to Glenn and the look on Glenn's face is is precious. It is it's so odd by what Herschel is giving him. And I I have to say this is one of my favorite scenes of the season. The other one has to be the, the Cherokee Rose scene, but these two scenes are just so full of deep character and love for each other. I wanna enter just a real quick side note. I literally on a podcast today heard about the movie In Cold Blood, which was written by Truman Capote about two young men that were murderers in Kansas. Scott Wilson, Herschel, played one of those oh. boys. So, so to see that he, the guys that were in the bar, you know, were those kind of characters. And that see him play a different role mm. in relation to those kind of characters is interesting. I think there's another deleted scene here where Lori is kind of coming up to the porch because she's going to go check on Beth also. And Dale comes out, and he's now trying to convince her to talk to Rick about not killing Randall. They have a whole thing, and she's like, well, I'm going to support Rick, and that's all there is to it. She also doesn't say she agrees with it in this moment either. But what she does say is to Dale, this isn't the time for philosophy. And Dale says, of course it is. And then, like, basically drops the mic and walks off the porch. I thought this scene was actually kind of funny, and I totally agree. If not now, when? When is yeah. the time for philosophy? When you're literally trying to build your own country, for however small or big it is, then it's always the time for philosophy, right? Yeah. There's a new scene on the farm porch where Rick is thinking, and he's kind of just there on the porch and Lori comes up and says it's almost time and she means it's almost time to do the vote rick says he has to be the one to uh do the execution himself because he was the one who should not have let randall come back from public works so does this mean that the fight and everything that happened at the public works was a waste of time yeah pretty much it was really just him floundering on whether he should kill him or not Mm -hmm. okay Rick says he knows Lori supports him, but he points out that she never says she agrees also. Because he's looking to have somebody make the decision for him. So he says he thinks it's the right call. The right Mm -hmm. call to kill Randall. We go to the creek where Carl is still tormenting that walker, running around him, throwing the rocks still. Curiosity Carl gets his consequences. I actually have a very big note about this. We're going to talk about this like maybe... If not the end of this episode, maybe in the next episode about what the consequences really are to what he's doing right now. It's not just him being scared by a walker. This is the start of a domino effect Mm -hmm. of all these things that happen. So this is a very good point. We'll talk about this a little more later on. Uh, So he takes aim at the walker's head with the gun. And then the walker gets out of the creek. And he starts to grab Carl's legs. You really shouldn't play with fire here because this is what happened. Carl drops the gun into the creek. Notice, take note of this moment. He drops the gun by the creek. We'll come back to that. Then he runs away and leaves the gun there. Never picks it up. And he leaves the walker there. Still by the creek. We have a scene where Carl has run away and the walker is still continuing to pull himself out of the silt. And right next to his head, 
lying there on the ground is the gun. So we have a confirmation at this point the gun is still by the creek. The reason why we're making such a big deal about this is that in the next episode, that gun comes back. Mm -hmm. We'll get there. Farmhouse. Beautiful sunset. Everything looks picturesque and lovely. And then they are about to make the decision. Lori tells Carl to go be with Jimmy and be away from the deliberation. So even Jimmy isn't old enough to be part of the deliberation. Beth isn't because she's still in bed. Then he kind of sneaks in anyway and everyone starts just glaring at him and he's like, fine. So he goes upstairs to be with Jimmy. So then Dale basically is like, well, the only person on my side in this whole thing is Glenn. And then Glenn gives him this look like, uh -uh, nope, nope, I'm not actually on your side on this one, buddy. I'm sorry, don't speak for me. <laughs> yeah, so Dale is the odd man out, literally. So this is really an interesting conundrum. These are the, the options they basically have. So either he is a prisoner and you keep him, but you have to feed him, you have to watch him, you have to make sure that you have a, a really stable place for him to be all the time. There's really no end game, and he might get loose anyway, right? So that's one of the options. They also talk about, well, yeah, he's using up our food, so why don't we just put him to work on the farm? But then they're like, yeah, then you have to have an escort for him. And that means that now you have instead one person who's not being productive, so that somebody else can be productive. Right. And then if you let him go, or if he escapes, then he's going to bring back his 30 guys who have already proved to be pretty nasty guys. Mm -hmm. So you don't want that. Especially the women to men ratio on this farm. That's not always great either. So you can kill him, which Dale says makes them uncivilized. Or you can drive him further out, like they were going to do, but that is also more risk, right? Because not only are you driving him out, but the person who is driving him out is at risk for whatever happens, and the guy could still bring him back with all those other people. Yeah, and so they start going over different execution methods, and Rick actually agrees with me, you gotta shoot him in the head. Mm -hmm. But there's a solution that they left out. Set the guy free inside your camp. But have somebody surreptitiously hidden away, constantly watching him. And this is just for a short period of time to see what he does. If he immediately takes whatever opportunity he can to escape and starts running off, the person watching him follows him. Now you see a camp of all these bad guys, shoot him before he gets there, and then come back. Now we know that he was a bad person. So we're, and we know that he was planning on bringing them back, so we know he's bad, we've got to get rid of him, you're, you're good at executing him there, and you have now done so without alerting them, and you know where they are. If, however, he doesn't run away, and he instead stays and he tries to make himself useful, you now know he's a good person, and you have rehabilitated him, and you have a new friend instead of a new enemy. Right. During this whole conversation, they keep showing Daryl and I wonder what he's thinking about. Is he thinking about the story that Randall keeps telling about the camp and trying to decide in his head if, if they should kill him? I don't know. Dale says, how are they any better than the people they are afraid of? And, you know, also, not speaking out or killing him yourself, there is no difference. Mm -hmm. And these are two really great points, Dale. I mean, this not... Taking a stand is not active advocation. Yeah, the way the, evil can parade is for good people to be silent. Mm -hmm. the, I mean, this those are really, really great points. And I think actually those points are what start to turn people's thoughts a little more. Dale calls Rick on his, we don't kill the living creed. Well, yeah. <laughs> but Rick has already killed two people now, mm -hmm. so... Yeah, and he says... That was before the living tried to kill us. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting in other places in the series and in Fear the Walking Dead where they build and fortify places in order to keep them prisoner. At this point, they aren't being adult enough to transition to a more stable jail for the good of humanity yet. I also kind of note that those civilizations that do have that ability to make a jail is because they have a much larger group. So they can actually have enough supplies and enough infrastructure to support having a jail. Where right here you have about a dozen people and winter is coming and they have limited building supplies. 
they may not actually have the resources to build a jail for him and rehabilitate him properly. So Andrea, the civil rights lawyer she should be, finally stands with Dale. And Dale gets really, like, kind of upset and touched by this, that this is happening. He is still upset that no one else is. So now it's just him and Andrea. He leaves and he goes to Daryl and he says, this group is broken. And I love when he says this, there's this shot of the angel, very clear shot of the angel wings right in the middle of the screen as he's saying this on the back of Daryl's leather jacket. And actually, this is a moment. I I just realized this. That is the moment where Dale passes to Daryl the truth talk position. That touch touches it and passes it off to him. Mm. Passing the torch. Yeah. We follow now Daryl, Rick, and Shane, who are taking Randall to the bar. You know, at this point, I think we think that they are going to shoot him. They're not going to hang him. But they do blindfold him, and it looks like it's going to be some kind of, like, firing squad. Mm-hmm. And they make him kneel. But Daryl looks really uneasy about the situation, even though... You know, he probably doesn't really care about killing him, but he just seems uneasy about what's happening. And Randall is just pleading. And then Carl comes in, okay, and sees what Rick is doing and and kind of starts goading Rick. Rick, you should shoot him. Whoa, Carl. Here we go again. So this causes Rick to lose his resolve because he sees that Carl Carl is acting and he does not like it. I don't like it either. No. So he tells Daryl to take, uh, take, still to take Randall away or take Carl away? Carl. Uh, no, to, to take Randall away. Okay, so he tells Daryl to take Randall away. Shane is not happy. He's like, we, come on, we need to do this already. I can't really tell what Carl is thinking when he's standing there in that barn. And I feel, I feel like he's watching. He's trying to figure out what Rick is thinking. Because this is the guy... This is a guy that he wants to become. Mm-hmm. He's trying to figure out what what are you thinking about in these moments where you, you are potentially going to be executing this person and you chose not to. What's going on in your head? Well, it's the two fathers. There's mm-hmm. two fathers in this. And the one he, a, a boy his age, action is the only thing he understands in that sense. So when he sees Shane being gung-ho for action, that's the one that makes sense to him deliberating doesn't make sense to a kid kids so for him it's like well this makes sense let's do it somebody's going to do something about it at the rv camp rick brings carl back and everyone is wondering well what happened you know what's going on with randall and rick says that they've decided to keep him in custody so andrea looks kind of happy at this and goes to find dale and i think she's happy because she's actively like dale's going to like this he wants to hear this news She's forgiven him. She wants him to be happy. Mm -hmm. But then Rick explains that Carl wanted to watch, and people are like, what? (laughs) So on the outer part of the farm, we see that Dale is walking, and he sees the pile of burned bodies, the walkers that they got from the barn, so we're out there. Then he sees a cow that is laying down with his intestines all out of her side. So a little bit about how this was done. Greg Nicotero wanted the cow to look eviscerated, So he bought real entrails from a butcher shop. The outside temperature was so high, the entrails steamed on their own at first. Now, this is actually interesting because they talk about how the temperature was really high. But when we get to the last episode of the season, the temperature is really low. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting that, that in that short amount of time, the temperature went high and low in the large dips. Yeah. So Dale gets attacked by the same walker that Carl was playing with. So this is so interesting to me how this whole plot point will feed into what happens in the next episode where uh, it just, like we said, the domino effect. So the first thing was Carl played with the walker. Carl let the walker go. The walker comes and kills Dale. So that's the first part of this arc. Everyone at the camp can hear Dale screaming. Lori tells Carl to go in the house and lock the door. I think we know Carl is not going to do this. No. no. Randall is left alone in the barn. Maggie says to Glenn, just Glenn, go. We go back and we see that the walker is getting Dale in the stomach. This walker really likes the stomach. Stomach of the cow, stomach yeah. of Dale. Daryl, 
comes running up. He grabs the walker and he kills him. Dale won't live to hear that they decided not to kill Randall. Yeah. He dies before that happens. Herschel can't do anything about it. He he can't save Dale. Rick is asking, can't do it. Carl, clearly not in the house, is standing behind everyone and notices that that is the same walker that he didn't kill. And this is where his guilt starts to set in. Rick tries to shoot Dale, but he can't do it. Daryl says that he will do it. Mm-hmm. So he steps up, and again, this is really good where your point comes in, where they shift to the mm-hmm. truth the truth teller, right? And when Dale looks at Daryl with this understanding of the fact that Daryl is going to shoot him before he turns, and he almost gives this, like, approval mm-hmm. in his eyes. Dale raises his head, right? Doesn't he raise his head toward the gun? Doesn't he actually oh, lift? he might, yeah. yeah. he actually lifts his head up to it. There is nothing in this but silence. There is no music during the credits. It's just silence. And this is the first time that has happened. So when when we first saw this and we know that Dale died, I think Corey and I both were really upset about the fact that Dale was dying. But in this watch through, I had we had a little extra knowledge. So Jeffrey D. Munn, who plays Dale, he was furious about the firing of longtime friend Frank Darabont from the series. Um, he was he developed the series and he previously acted as a showrunner and then he was fired. So because Jeffrey was so angry about this, he asked to be let go from the show. So that is why they killed him off. Yeah, and but- Jeffrey D. Munn was in everything Darabont ever did. Shawshank, mm-hmm. Green Mile. The Majestic, all these movies. He was a really loyal friend to to Darabont. So let's let's talk about here. We talk about who kills the living, who died. We know Dale died in this moment. But is this a who kills the living situation? Is this a Carl kills the living? Or is it Daryl kills the living? Where does this fall? Or does it? Okay, so I don't blame Carl exactly. He did some stupid stuff. Mm -hmm. But I I think there has to be an intentional action here to say that you killed the living. You've chosen to do something to end someone's life. So I I think that's how we decided it was going to go. If their intention is to do it... A.K.A. Shane incapacitates Otis so that he gets killed by a walker. That's that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I don't blame Carl. He's not the killer in my eyes. Daryl kills Dale, but he doesn't do so for any reason of selfishness or self-protection. He doesn't do it for utility. He does it for mercy. I don't agree with you. I don't think Daryl killed... I don't think he killed him. Because he's pretty much dead already. Ooh! Thank you! Woo! But no, my other my other thing about that is he was already dead because of being eaten. Yeah. It was going to kill him. So I don't think we can assign this death to Daryl. I don't think we can. To sound woo-woo, what Marshall was saying about what Daryl was doing is he's putting his consciousness to rest. Mm-hmm. It's not just not just that there's something. What Dale was saying is there's more to life than what we can touch, what we can see, what we all this stuff. It's more than just survival. There's more to being human than that. And in yeah. what Daryl did in that moment is said, I acknowledge what's more to you than the material. I acknowledge your spirit. I acknowledge what you were trying to do. And I know how to be a brother to you, even though I was never given the brother that I needed. And that is actually the last thing that Daryl says. Mm -hmm. Goodbye, brother. Let's talk about the name of this episode. I do have a very good point about this, but I will not take credit for it. I found it on, I believe, IMDb in the trivia section. The name of this episode is called Judge, Jury, Executioner. And it implies that these roles will be filled out for Randall's fate. However, only the judge and jury roles pertain to him, with Rick as the judge and the group being the jury. The executioner is Daryl, 
who instead kills a suffering Dale when Rick cannot bring himself to do it. So, yes, I I kind of agree with the, what they're saying about this. What do you guys think? Daryl kills the defense lawyer. <laughs> I'm, I think it, one thing that's interesting about this, it, it just dawned on me, is the whole thing is, this whole episode is about blame, right? So, like, is this someone we should blame? Is this someone we should punish? Talking about Randall, right? Mm -hmm. Now we have a clear blame thing. This is the zombie that Carl was messing with, and the consequences was that. Mm -hmm. So it's like interesting where they finally found an actual case of this is an enemy in that right. sense, yeah. and a clear cut case of justice mm -hmm. kind of thing. I thought that was kind of interesting. I also feel like this episode highlights the need in a society for there to be separate roles for judge, jury, and executioner. They have to be separate people. The jury is given all of these options. Is this somebody that we need to deal with or not? The judge says, this is the rules to society and how we've decided to deal with it, and says, we're going to do it. And then the executioner actually does it. They need to be separate people because if these roles overlap, people start making bad calls, they lose their nerves. Rick acted as both judge and executioner then chickened out because he couldn't deal with what the ramifications were for his family. Mm -hmm. And then this is later supported by a conversation that Rick and Daryl have in the next episode. Right. So that's what I think this is all about. It's about the justice in a new society. I do think, though, there is an executioner, which we find out in the next episode. Mm -hmm. There is a clear executioner. It just doesn't happen in this episode, so it doesn't fall under the title. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for listening to this week's episode. Next week, we're going to talk about Season 2, Episode 12, Better Angels. Thank you for listening to Sunday of the Dead and exploring each episode with us. If you have any interesting facts or details about an upcoming episode, feel free to email us at share at elatedgeek.com. We want to bring you new and exciting geek-worthy content. If you want to help, please consider donating to our coffee account. The link is in the show notes, and every donation is accepted with total appreciation for your support. Follow us on social media for more of our geek obsessions. Find Laney on at Zany Laney or me at One True Hazard. For updates, keep an eye on Adelated Geek on Instagram or Adelated Geek Tweets on Twitter. Or go to our website at www.elatedgeek.com. Links for these are in the show notes. Until next time, geek out.